uh, tell me, friends, uh, how did you first hatch the idea to form a band? We didn't. It just we just drifted together. Nobody thought of forming a band ever. We just were hanging around the club and started playing with each other, and nobody said we'll make a band. We just. Just ended up this way. You really think I would ever plan to play with him? <laughs> <laughs> no, truly, that's that's what happened. And then we started when we realised. I I remember distinctly the first time we realised we could all play one tune together. And then so we went from there. We started. Well, this is all right. And we started practicing seriously after that. It's what you call your seminal moment. In 1971. Yes. That so was and the club you're talking about was Fiddler's Green Club. And you used to play at first only in the club, right? No, we never really played in the club. We, we just used to get together in people's houses and tinkle along. And, then, and after we'd officially formed as a band, we started playing in the club as a band. But until then, Grit and I played in the club regularly. Right? To start the night. And Richard yeah. Avery used to play with us as well. And we just to start the night, we played together. And then he got religion, and that was the end of it. <laughs> when, did, when did you think of yourselves as a band? We still don't. <laughs> no. true. Let's see. Yeah. Once we started practicing, which was what? 71? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we started practicing in the 70s. <laughs> we're, more of a, we're more of a sort of loosely associated, uncooperative. Yeah. 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 See, we're a very unusual band. We don't really rehearse. All Can of you us do it? our own things. The only thing we go over is the tunes, the melodies, the dance tunes. The rest of it's more or less up to whoever does what when they're on the stage. Which is still yeah. the legacy of us being individual singers and performers who all got together. We do our own thing. It's like a big sing around, and in between, for variety, we'll play instrumentals together. And then while we're there, we'll accompany some of the others, sometimes with a full band, sometimes one other instrument. But Tam's right, on any given night, we don't know what any of us is going to sing. It's what happens on stage, the mood, the previous song, and we think this one's a good one to follow that with. It's what happens. So what brings you people together musically? Well, I'm, I'm in love with Kit. Yeah. <laughs> I've been for many years. <laughs> I'm going to keep saying no. Please don't just, tell Judith. All right. We just had a love of, initially of British music, yeah. and uh, we drifted on from there. Now, Kit writes that Canadian stuff. But, uh, but we initially we got great into doing British British music as well, and all of us like doing British folk music. Yeah, it's not just the music though. We, we share a common sense of humour and approach to the music. Oh, and definitely. And uh, <laughs> Martin Tam has right, a come. different sense. <laughs> you know, it just um, and, and the places we play are the kind of places we all like to play. So so there's that. It's an unusual setup, and, and what we do, I think, is quite unusual for a band. Yeah. Why is that, Alistair? Why do you like the places where you play? Because when we get together, it's a social event for us. Because we don't play often in you know in a year. We'll play three, four, maybe in a really good year, five times, you know, in a year. So we may not see each other for a couple of months. So when we get together, um, we go out for a meal, we spend time having a laugh, you know, and, and the concert's just part of the package for us. I, so, think, yeah. I think we also have an, we all have an underlying philosophy that. Um, this kind of music has uh, it has a, ver a very strong social function, which is perhaps even stronger than any artistic function it might have. It's really, you know, it, it's designed to get people together, to, to have people enjoy themselves, to get people to participate. And uh, and I think when the band gets together, that's that's all part of that. You know, we're, it's social for us between us, but it's also social for the audience. And the audience sees us having a good time on stage. Yeah and that rubs off on them as well. And there's something else too, because we are our own audience. Like when we sing, we're singing for the band. When we tell a joke, we're telling it to the band. That's right. We almost certainly haven't heard. We try Maybe to get them to break up. We yeah, call yeah. for our own encores, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, uh, I have to be honest with you, I've never enjoyed it. <laughs> never enjoyed it? Okay. No, I, no, no. Well, I knew that. Okay. Yeah, right. Tam's oh, in therapy, that's why I don't do pay it. any attention. Yeah, yeah, right. the 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 we always try, if we tell a joke, our main intention is not to break up the audience, it's to break up the band. <laughs> Try and tell something they've never heard before, you know? Yeah. Just to see if they can handle it. How would you set up your gigs? <laughs> Wait, I mean, how would we get them? Yeah. Well, well last well, night... Nobody we, will. <laughs> <laughs> last, last night we played at the Ark in Ann Arbor, and every time I have seen Dave Siglin, who runs the Ark, 
uh, between uh, about the last six years. Every time I've seen him, he says, so when are you coming to play? He emailed uh, me and said, yeah. could, you, could you talk to the other yeah. fellow? You yeah, know? I mean, yeah. basically, yeah. Yeah. It's, it, you know, it's whenever we can coordinate, and that's not yeah. very often. <laughs> it's just our well, lives are just yeah, too and we're crazy. all we're all performing as individuals too, you know. So weekends are at a premium, so to get us all available at the same time has has been hard. Yeah, it's well, it's cost them a fortune. <laughs> but, yeah, but that's right, right. basically we're asked, and we go where we're asked. Once in a while, we might talk to people who run a festival, you know, and yeah, hope that it might happen. Yeah, yeah. But usually, it's we're responding to people who want to have us. They and ask do it us. There. And yeah, years in years past, way back, it used to be four or five concerts a month yeah. Yeah. in the earlier days and largely because we're just busy with other things you know it is it's few and far between but we still have a great time where have you had the most fun playing in festivals and clubs and what? New York. Bermuda was good Bermuda, Bermuda, Bermuda was yeah, great Bermuda. Yeah. Bermuda was good we took all our families to Bermuda as well we were the only um, people swimming on the island in uh, Christmas. I, I don't think yeah. you could define it like that, you know, yeah. that the festivals are better than... Co some concerts are just an absolute riot, and we laugh the whole night, and some concerts are dead as a doornail, depending on the audience, you know. Yeah, and the same with festivals. Sometimes it's hard. I mean, we've played in front of 50,000 people and got no response whatsoever down in uh, uh, Michigan at a bluegrass festival. They had us on at a bluegrass <laughs> festival. <laughs> and, you know, it just depends yeah. where you are. We think they just misread the bio. We know. just can't define it, you know? Yeah. I, my, my vote is for clubs more. Yeah. Yeah. Because we have them for a whole it. night. And we yeah. can give them two hours worth of music and have some fun with them and they get to know us, even people who haven't heard us before. But at a festival, Besides some workshops, which may or may not be interesting, you, you've got your 25-minute concert slot. And depending on where they put you, if, if it's at a certain point in the night when all the yahoos are drunk and they just want something loud and fast, you know, it's not what we're about. We're about, like Ian said, connecting with the audience, not being distant from them and being the big performers, you know. We love it, but it's never going to happen for us. It takes us 20 of that 25 minutes just to get Tam to shut up before <laughs> <laughs> we sing the first song. That's right. Yeah, so that's a problem. I'm never going to speak again. <laughs> has has the, uh, the act changed a lot over the years? I'd say the only thing that we don't do as much of is harmony singing together. It's the only thing, that the rest of it is same, bang, bang, go, go, but we don't sing in harmony together, lump, big harmonious songs anymore. We chorus, but we used to do songs with, you know, two-part harmony, three-part, and, and all, and I don't think we do as much as that anymore. Some of that might be because it was coming from David Perry's repertoire, yeah, yeah. who passed away in 95, and uh, that, that was a lot coming from him. He would choose those songs that suited six-part harmony, and we'd work out arrangements and have fun doing it. But, you know, that's part of what this band is. We're all responding to the individual repertoires. Who brings what to the band? What kind of tune? What kind of song? And just uh, fitting it in from, from what people bring. And I have to say, in this band, in 30 odd years, nobody has ever said to anybody, well, that's terrible. Don't sing that. Whatever they want to sing, they sing. And we just, we just do our best to go with it. We've wanted to say that to you, but <laughs> we haven't yet. You, you've lost a, a couple of your core members over the years. Uh, yes. And how did you overcome that loss? We just carried on. Really, that's all that happens. That's all you can do. Yeah. I think the, sp the spirit lives on. You know, I mean, David certainly, and, and Stu before him. Uh, we, I mean, I sing some of the songs that David sang, and and you know, people say, well, you know, doesn't it bother you to to steal his songs, basically? But uh, to me, it's just, you know, David wouldn't have wanted those songs to just stop being sung by the friends, so I, you know, I, I take them on, and they're great songs. And we insult David as much now as we did then. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. 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 Still, still. Just because he's dead, that doesn't that's mean he's getting off easy, small. you know. <laughs> what was the music scene like when you first started out with the band? What was the... What was the music scene like? Toronto. Well, Canada. Toronto, Toronto uh, was a coffee house scene, such as a mu folk music. There was Grumble's Coffee House and there's various other ones. We went and got coffee and they'd maybe one act for the night. And the riverboat, you know, where they put on our special. And we were the first place to open up that took on guest sets. In other words, 
you know, we'd had three or four people singing before the main act and encouraging young people to try out. As a result, a lot of the people we know today all practice in places like our club, you know. And we, we really invented in Toronto the folk club uh, attitude as opposed to the coffee house attitude. Because Fiddler's Game was never a coffee house. This is kind of based on the on the British folk British club folk model, club, yeah. where you know you would you would have a, a host for the night or a resident singer, as they'd call them, and they would kind of introduce everybody. But at some point in the in the in the proceedings, they would have a slot where maybe three or four or five uh, floor singers, as they would call them, come, would come up from the audience and sing a couple of songs, and and that was a it was a really great way to develop singers. You know, you'd have a lot of young yeah. kids who'd come up and just try out the couple of songs they'd learned that month, you know, and, and I mean, that's the way I started in England. I wouldn't be singing here if it wasn't Still starting. Yeah, I'm still, I'm still doing but, that. You know, we never auditioned anybody, ever. And a guy would come in with a guitar and say, can I sing? And we'd just let him go. And some of the stuff they came away with on the stage was an absolute riot. And there was a couple of times I had to go up and grab the guy physically and haul him off the stage because <laughs> he was getting too racist or too political or whatever, you know. But it was a great fun that way. Always unusual. The scene, though, was flourishing. That's yeah. a good word for it. Even the Fiddles Green Club used to run two nights a week in those days and sell out. People would drive up from Buffalo to catch acts at, at that club. That was for the folk music part of it. But yeah. We'd also have bluegrass night, country dance night. But you know, almost seven nights. Morris years. dancers Other met there. Were, yeah. The Irish, there. Irish fiddlers and, and tune players would meet there on another night. Uh, shape note singers would meet at the That's club. Sunday, yeah. uh, it was a focal point for a lot of the folk scene in Toronto for quite a long while. Yeah, and yeah. If, you, if you look at the, the general scene that you see around uh, Toronto, a lot of it is, is still developed down from Fiddler's Green. People that went there when they're young and still like it and are now doing things themselves, you know. And, and their children are now doing it as well. What do you think the impact of the band has been on uh the Canadian music scene. Most of them say, don't ever do that. Yeah. <laughs> I think we've taught people not to take themselves too seriously. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. there's, there's a certain earnestness about the folk scene, both on both sides of the uh, of the border, um, which I don't think any of us is overly earnest. And and I think there are some, some players who have learned that skill, if you want to call it that. Don't take yourself too seriously, because audiences don't like it. That's also how bands work. I mean, I, I mean, you've said this is unusual, meeting it relatively rarely, you know, and not seeing one another. We we all got on really well, and we meet occasionally, and and that doesn't happen with bands that are in this hot house, you know. And I think, in a sense, pe people kind of look at a band with, with longevity like, like this one, and I would think maybe see ways of kind of interacting or keeping your ego suppressed, you know, or or, or, or you know, I always thought of it like like rapper dancing, where to make the thing work. You make yourself less good to make the whole thing better. You know, that kind of thing where you kind of give up yeah. for other people. You know, and I, I, we did used to meet every week in either Ian's house or our house for, for early days. Early learning days. early days. And a practice consisted of two hours of practice and two hours of figuring out what to do to somebody that wasn't there. So you, you, you had to turn up or else you, were, yeah. some, you had to keep looking behind you in case something happened to you. <laughs> and so we kept laying traps for them, you know. It's just all part of the game. <laughs> uh, did you ever get together just to sing for fun, not in front of an audience? Well, you do that at festivals. Yeah. We used to get together in the stairwell of the hotel and, and just all sing together, just to, to sing. You know, that's calmed down a bit because we're all getting older and wanting to go to our bed at 11 o'clock now. You know, <laughs> whereas before we stay up till three in the morning and just sing for fun, four yeah. parties. Parties. That's what we would like oh, to do at parties. New Year parties. Singing, New Year's singing, parties singing yeah, dancing. You see, we have a big circle with about 20 or 30 people singing in harmony. Um, give me one of your uh, memorable stories that you've told at uh, <laughs> uh, times before. Just one. There's too many. Oh, yeah. About somebody or about the band or what? No. Tell me the story about uh, Grit and the Gas Tank. <laughs> wow. Wait, 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 wait. How about Ann Arbor, where we just were, the Ark? Right. How about one of those yeah, stories? Okay. Story. When we the took movie. the audience to the movies. Yeah, we, 
That's never happened. We, 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 we played two nights in Ann Arbor, and, and the, the guy running the club said, Do you want to play a third night? It's, it's un unadvertised, but you never know, some people might show up. And we'd all decided we wanted to go and see a, a Scottish movie that was playing in Ann Arbor called That Sinking Feeling, one of Bill Forsyth's first film ever. And the audience showed up, there's about, I don't know, 10 or 12 of them. So we took all them to well, the well, movie. the thing was that we discovered that they paid seven dollars to get in, yeah. and the movie only cost five dollars. So we reckon if we took them to the movies, we'd make a profit. <laughs> and so that's what we did. And so. we went down and we sang in the theatre to well, the audience. The we took them on, on, we had a van, we crammed everybody in, left the van doors open, drove through Ann Arbor that way, got to the theatre, went down to the front, in front of the screen, sang some Scottish songs, and the guy in the lighting booth and, 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 and running the camera just thought, well, this must be part of the show. So the minute we finished our song, the lights dimmed, the movie started, we saw the film, we brought them back to the club. Oh, we also bought them popcorn, we remember did. that? Yeah. And we had a few brought stragglers them. came as well. We yeah, a few <laughs> stragglers just came in. Yeah, we had more people back at the club when we got back there. But we did, we brought them back, played another set of music, and then sent them home. That's never happened. This is at the Ark in Ann Arbor. But if you want to know about the gas tank, <laughs> I was trying to avoid this. How old were you? Nineteen. Uh, very young and immature. He was about nineteen. Nineteen, yeah. And he bought a Volvo car, and he comes. Our club had a, its own car park for about fifty or sixty cars. Right? He comes switching him in the car. He says, "The oh, car, and we said, oh, that's terrific. Many miles to the gallon you get with that." He says, "I don't know. I've only had it a day." So every night for two months, I went down and put two gallons of gas in his tank, and he's now up to 800 miles to the gallon, and he's bragging about it, <laughs> telling, telling people. I had, I had heard all these great things about Volvos, and it was my first car, what did I know? And I literally was coming in with the pad, with the calculations every night at the club. You wouldn't believe the mileage I'm getting, you know, it's incredible. So I thought I had a faulty gas gauge, because it was going like this all the time. And the best part was, those kids played street hockey, where he parked, and they would see Little me, tufts, you know, see the cigarettes. putting the gas in his tank and he asked me what I was doing and I told him. So every night he parked and these kids would come up to him and say, how many miles to the gallon this week? And he would tell these kids. But then I started siphoning it out. Now he's down to two miles to the gallon or something. And a policeman caught me siphoning it out. And I said, honestly, it's only a joke. He takes me up to his door and knocks on it. And he opens the door and he's there. The cop says, do you know this guy? He said, never saw him before. <laughs> <laughs> I could take to the police and my wife had to come and get me out. <laughs> but it's things like that that go on all the time, you know. There are stories about everybody. You know, the first record we did, first record we did, Ian agreed to finance it with oh. some money from his estate from his mum. Am I right? Am I yes, remembering right? right? Yeah. So we thought we should have some kind of formal agreement between Ian, who's financing it, and us, and how he'd no, get paid I back. Thought, no, oh, you thought? Okay, well, all right. Yeah. We were happy with the money. We were happy with the way it was. Just take the money. So we thought, all right, we'll do a piece of paper in between us. So, so I, I made up this really kind of fairly formal letter, and I sent it to Tam. And first mistake. Was first mistake, yeah, right. right. So I get back this letter, um, just taking, you know, making fun of everything I had written and just tearing the whole thing apart and you know and I think it was on a, a on a letterhead of Peak Freen's chocolate, yeah. to, to, chocolate digestive just biscuits, biscuits or something right. like which that. we always ate yeah. and then we, we got we got them back finally Lawrence had a tape made with a CBC newsreader because Lawrence works at CBC and it says the guy's reading the news at six o'clock on a Saturday night. Who was it, Kevin Marsh or something? Kevin yeah. Marsh. I think yeah. we, put, we put the tape in the tape recorder when Ian wasn't looking and said, here's the CBC News. It was at six o'clock. Six o'clock. And, and, and they went through the old and the, the, the economic crisis. And, 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 and a dispute has happened, uh, was it, between the Friends of Fiddler's Green and Ian Robb in Ottawa. And they went on and on. <laughs> and it get to the point where we told Ian to fuck off fat face. <laughs> and he even said all that on the tape, you know. Oh, we <laughs> really got them. Good, good. But the other thing we did with the chocolate, the chocolate digestive biscuits, we, we always had them for tea when we were practicing. And we lived there. It was great, didn't we? And every time you came in the door, say, well, you're last in. You have to go for the cookies. It took him eight years before he discovered that we lived there. And we were never <laughs> going to be last in. And then we were sitting there one day, David Parry was teaching in 
Israel. No, Cambridge. Oh, Cambridge, yeah, okay. He, this is, you know, he should have some of these. So we've got a film tin, and we've lined it with foam rubber and put one chocolate digestive cookie in it, sealed it and mailed it to him with a custom slip that says, experimental drug, no street value. <laughs> and, and the police took him to the police station and made him open it. And then the policeman said, right, eat it. And they all wanted to eat <laughs> to see what would happen to us. We, we did the same thing with David. We, we, usually when we go out for a concert, we'll have a meal somewhere. And David was teaching in Jerusalem That's what it was. for a year. So we thought it was a shame that David was missing his fine meal. So we ordered an extra meal. David. And we put it in an envelope and mailed it to him in Jerusalem. <laughs> he, he never talked about that, did he? <laughs> never did mention that. No, no. That's the sole point. Yeah. It, just go, it just goes on and on like that all, all the time, you know. But that's okay, you know. You Sherry, got... how did you come to join this uh, oh. band? You know? <laughs> oh, yeah, I was wondering that myself. <laughs> yeah. Customs yeah. asked me that just today because being I there. came through. Um, I was a student at the University of Toronto. band music. But it, it just reminded me of a story. When I first joined the band, everybody here kept telling me stories and I was immensely paranoid. I was sure something was going to happen. And they said, oh, for our first gig, we're all going to dress in dinner attire. Very elegant. And I thought, yeah, right. Because I had heard, what, the stories about the pajamas, the stories about the business suit. Oh, no, we haven't mentioned the pajamas. Oh, my yet, goodness, right? yeah. Don't talk about the pajamas. No, it's best not to talk about the pajamas. Yeah. So, anyway, I was convinced that something was going on, and I didn't want to let anybody out of my sight. And they kept saying, you can go change your clothes over there. And I kept thinking, no, 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 I want to watch you. Because I was so convinced. So the joke was on me. You know, after, you after all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, oh, you guys are wonderful. Absolutely. And, and then David's our youngest member. Uh, Ian, 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 sorry, he's our youngest oh, member. We've only had yeah. him. Five yeah, on and off for five years. Yeah, the kid in the band. He's in training. <laughs> Friends of Christmas Green in training. That's right. Yeah. We actually just hired him for his hairline. <laughs> yeah, how, did, how did you come to the band? Um, I believe Tom was injured at the time. They needed someone to strum the guitar, so I play up in Ottawa with Ian and a couple of different groups, and uh, he suggested I. Actually, the friends were playing in Ottawa when I first the first time I played with them, and they were needing someone to help out, so I joined in then. And then they uh, just keep asking me to play with them. So what's it like playing with them? It's a good laugh. <laughs> 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 That's the best way to describe. <laughs> no, I mean, it's it's and the money's great. The money is. Oh, the yeah. money. Yeah, yeah, the money. money. But I'm, I know so much of your show is improvised, or you know, it happens on at, at the time of the performance. How do you, uh, you know, if you're a newer member, how do you adjust to this? How do you know? How can you see what's coming? <laughs> you don't know exactly what's coming, but you just you go with the flow. You know, there's a, a certain number of tunes that have been in the repertoire since I've been there that come up again and again. So um, you just got to be ready. Um, and, and you have to play like, along. I've noticed they have trouble keeping a piano player, so you have to yeah. like abuse. Yes. We keep getting pregnant. The piano this. players explode. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, they like, explode. Yeah, right. <laughs> like certain drummers, you know. Okay. And Lawrence, tell me, uh, you are the one. You're the one fiddle player. I am one of three. I'm one of three. three. No there are three well, okay. in the band. I three. just happen to be. I'm the apprentice. Three. Well, two and a half. Okay. Yeah, two and a half. <laughs> so I yeah, and no, I'm just uh, I'm just the guy that was there first. Yeah. He's our the main fiddler. Sherry plays piano and fiddle as well. Lots oh, and of harmony harp, stuff. Harp this and harp. Oh yes. Yeah. She's just brought a harp in. Yeah. Are you, are you playing kind of, harp tonight? Yeah, yeah. This kind. Yeah. Of. Yeah. yeah. Not. Alistair plays that kind of harp. Yeah. yeah. And I just hop on. Yeah, the other ones. Yeah, yeah I know. I'll train that. Lawrence is one of the fiddle players. When did you join the band? I'm, we're trying to remember. I think it was 1976. <laughs> no, it wasn't that late. It must have been because. Um, when did Morris start? When did it was, Morris start? Um, well, no, it, it actually worked. Uh, the way I remember it is my, my daughter was born in 1975. And a year after that, I was asked to be the fiddle player for Green Fiddle Morris. 
And uh, while I was out there fiddling away in the car park for the Morris, uh, Tom heard me speak. And that was the end of me, because he yeah. said, uh, do you want to join a band? <laughs> Scottish, you're in. <laughs> um, and That's then, happened to me too. Yeah, yeah within about six months, he's actually uh, told me about a house that was up for sale and I was in the market, and I ended up living next door to him for about eight years. Which was we very handy. Them. Yeah, and, and it was very handy for me because because I was sort of two doors away, I didn't have to buy the cookies either. No, 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 no. And you'll notice I'm sitting between them to keep them apart, you know, so there's no, there's no trouble here tonight. Uh, uh, great. Uh oh. <laughs> you want to know how I got in the band? I don't have the mic. Yeah. Yeah. Talk into it. You're you're as close to it as I'm. Shelly says, how does a nice Jewish boy like you get into a band? Like I don't. This? Yeah. My parents are still wondering that, you know. Right? <laughs> so, when are you going to do some nice Hebrew songs? <laughs> <laughs> What's all this British stuff? Yeah. Tell them about the fish and chips. Oh, yes, so oh. we tried. My aunt invited us to play for the British night at their synagogue. Right? So, <laughs> get the experts, right? With the connection. So, they'd never done this before. So, as part of the night, they were going to make fish and chips. So my uncle's at the back in the, in the big kitchen, the industrial kitchen, and he said he keeps throwing the fish into the deep fry and it disappears. disappears. It, go back. It's nowhere. And we go in and, and there's some, it goes at the bottom of this big vat of oil, there's a little crease in the metal where it goes and and he hadn't heated up the oil. So didn't you, didn't you turn it on? He's why? Why turn it on? So the oil was cold, so nothing floated up and it just disappeared. We had to get the experts in to help how to cook, you know, right? <laughs> and then, and then we were singing so well, but Great San came up, was your aunt, wasn't it? Yeah. She came up and says, your songs aren't dirty enough. Yes, my, that was my great aunt. She's great right. aunt. She's just In her 80s, she said, you're happened. too clean, come on. Let's have some fun here, you know? What happened when you turn the towel on though? We turned the fat on, then all this fish oh, came up. In one lump. That's right. Yeah. All the fish stuck. Soggy batter of love. British night. Well, that was very true. British yeah, night, yeah, from yeah, what I hear, yeah, anyway. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah. know. But where, how did you get. Oh, yeah, you came to the club. Just like you described earlier, yeah. I did a guest set. Yeah. And 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 I this band and I didn't know British dance tunes at that point. I didn't even know their structure. I, I didn't even know where the A him, part began or the B part. We got him and Colin Linden mixed up. We thought that we were we were hiring a real Colin hot Linden. shot guitar. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was too late. I'd signed the contract. Yeah, right, right, right. 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 Which well, was Ross, Colin had signed the contract. And, but I was buying the cookies. He'll <laughs> stay. Right, right. So how did you end up uh, performing in a back alley near the garbage can? Yeah, right. <laughs> hey, this is a step up for us. Yeah, no, yeah, right. Right. <laughs> Ken, you want to end this with a uh, with a, a clean joke? You know any? <laughs> wait, I have a question. Just before that. Wait, wait, a question. I'm I'm just I'm curious. It, it's been what, 30, 30 years now. Thirty five years. Thirty two years. Thirty two years. Is it bizarre to look around at each other thirty two years later? I'll tell Answer you. No, because we've all we've all grown, grown together. Yeah. Yeah. Answer to call. Answer me. We've all grown together, so we don't really. No, it's the difference in us. Yeah. You know, Ian's always looked the keen as far as I'm concerned. You Interesting know, thing, though. When we didn't see him for five yeah. years, all of a sudden, not it's the difference. But pretty much we see each other four or five times a year, and it, yeah. it doesn't make any difference. But Tom and Lynn got married recently. Oh, yeah. And we all went to the wedding. And we saw a lot of people we hadn't seen since the early days of Fiddler's Green. And it was like our pals couldn't make it, so they sent their parents. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna carry on. Yeah, that's true. For us, it seems the same. But I guess the biggest difference is for those who have kids who've grown up. You know, we remember when they were born and we were that's playing. That's right. You know, None of us and now they're all adults with their careers and husbands and you know. Thirty-year-old kids now. We never had any kids when we started. You know, yeah. all that's started with a band. So music when music was one. Yeah, yeah, right. Some of our newest members have young ones, but you know, for the for the old core. You know, right. you know we're hoping uh, Evelyn. Perry is supposed to get here straight from Halifax and, and to sing a song or two yeah. tonight. I haven't seen her yet, but you know, that's one of those kids that's grown up to be oh, a she's, performer. She's, yeah. she's, a, she's an asset to Toronto Theatre. She's so she's so original with what she does. <laughs> so, Sophie, huh?
Liam, any uh, Jason? No, Erica? I have one request though. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to get you, Coleman, if you can think up of any question or it doesn't have to make any kind of sense. And sure. Erica, if you can actually film everybody who's not talking mm -hmm. in type, and we'll just get. So just act naturally and answer yeah. the question as if we were filming you, but we're actually filming everybody who's listening. And actually, before we do that, <laughs> can we get everyone to say their name? First and last, yeah. so see if you can do the way. Name and what they do in the day. Start uh, from the old day first. Yeah. To oh. Coleman. Okay, to Coleman. Yeah. To Coleman. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I mean, just no one? Yeah. So, everybody. So, uh, why, don't, why don't we start with uh, Ian? Start down with Ian? Start, start, start with Ian? Ian and, Clark. Uh, so, everyone, tell me. What do you do in the band, and uh, what is your name, and what do you do in the band? Ian Clark, I play guitar. I'm Alistair Brown, I play button accordion and concertina and harmonica, and I sing. I'm Ian Robb, and I defend myself against the Scottish people in this band. <laughs> I, also, I also play concertina and sing. And I'm Tam Kearney, and I play mostly banjo now, and, and sort of sing. Oh, and I tell jokes, so does Alistair. I'm Grit Laskin, I play tenor mandolin and guitar and pipes. Northumbrian pipes and a little bit of fiddle when they let me. And I sing. And I'm Lawrence Stevenson and I play fiddle. I'm Sherry Whalen and I play piano and fiddle and a little bit of harp. Okay. Just any questions that have to be what have, what, have, what have been been some of your most satisfying uh, experiences or accomplishments over the years? That's a hard one. We're all, we enjoy it all the time. We go out and we play and we, they're all satisfying. We don't, we don't look at one and say, that one was better than that one. Most of the time we just have a good time together. Because it's a big social event for us all to get together and have dinner and go and play. And even when we rehearse, it's a social event when we rehearse, which isn't much rehearsal. But an hour before the concert we rehearse. And it's just a Not tonight. Story. We've been talking to the film crew here. Yeah. There most, goes the rehearsal. Most of us don't actually remember anything before last year, anyways. So. <laughs> I'd say that was a hard question for me. That was a hard. That's a hard question to answer. I have an answer to that one. I remember. I think it was Mariposa, and we were playing. Um, you know, we were doing our usual thing, and during some of the dance tunes, I looked out, and people weren't doing country dancing, but they were dancing, and they were young people, and they were really enjoying. And it was just kind of cool to see it going to the next generation and to realize, oh yes, there are people that still appreciate this and can enjoy it. You know, maybe they weren't doing the steps that were prescribed, but they were really into it and really enjoying their time. So that was great. That makes me think of something. Uh, one time, also a festival, and we're playing our, our set in the evening concert or something, and we're finishing off with some fast dance tunes. And for a number of years, when Ian Robb's daughters were young, they were step dancers and they'd come out and dance with us. And they weren't my kids, but they, that made me so excited to be playing the tunes for dancing, which they were meant for, and such good dancing, and the audience loved it. That was a high. That I must high. say, I was very proud of them at one Mariposa when it rained really badly, and all the stages, sound equipment, quit on all the stages. And the only stage that was still going was us with no sound equipment. We were still singing to people, we were getting them up on the stage and dancing, and I was very proud of that. We were the only people in the whole festival that were still playing. Determined but moist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our new slogan, determined yeah. but moist. <laughs>